Greetings and welcome to the third part of the Tripoli 23 Lecture 8 in Magnetostatics. In this meeting, I will introduce to you the concept of magnetic circuits. You're already familiar with circuits, but uh, what you know or what, what, uh, what you have already encountered is actually the flow of electrons creating a current. Okay. The flow of electrons creating a current uh, basically is defined by the magnetic by the electric field. So the current density by Ohm's law is equal to sigma e. Okay. For our uh, for our magnetic circuits, a magnetic field also creates some form of current, and you have already encountered this. The quote and quote current density within a magnetic field is actually okay, let's look at this diagram right here there, if there's a current flowing through this coil okay, through this loop of wires that has n turns uh, if we perform Ampere's law here so an approximate uh, path would be something like this it's a square path all right we know that each loop of current generates magnetic field. Okay, there's no magnetic field here. Let's assume that. Okay, let's assume it for now. All right. Uh, it turns out it's not true, but it's a reasonable assumption. Okay. So uh, let's. Uh, some magnetic field is generated here, and with ma with magnetic field we create magnetic flux. And the relationship between the magnetic flux and the magnetic field intensity. Uh, magnetic flux density and magnetic field intensity is this right here. So recall in our conducting materials, this Ohm's law holds. An equivalent, uh, equivalent expression in magnetic field is this. This is the microscopic form of quote end quote Ohm's law in our magnetic circuits. Okay, so let's uh, extract each element. Okay. J is the current density. B is the quote end quote current density in magnetic circuits. H is the field intensity. And E is also a field intensity. What is sigma? Sigma is the conductivity of the material. Mu is the permeability of a material. So what does con the conductivity stand for? The conductivity is, uh, is a measure of how much current will the material of, uh, let, fl let flow, okay? or how much the material can make, or how much electrons can the material uh, flow given an electric field. I hope that made sense. All right, so that is something similar to our uh, magnetic materials. The permeability mu, uh, the permeability mu defines how much magnetic flux uh, does a material allow for a given magnetic field intensity. Okay, so you see where this is going at. If we integrate J with some surface, which is the cross-sectional sur uh, cross-section of the conductor, we have our current. Okay? We can also do that with our magnetic field, magnetic flux density. So if we let B integrate that with some cross-sectional area of a material, okay, what is the uh, what is the resulting value? That's your magnetic flux. Phi. Okay? And that is actually the current that is flowing in our magnetic circuits. Alright? What else? There's also a concept of magnetic potential. Okay? Magnetic potential came from the integral of H dot BL. Okay? H dot BL. Specifically negative. Okay? It act is actually uh, just looks like it just actually looks like negative integral of e dot dl. Why? 
However, this h.dl here, if we uh, create a loop around this path right here, this h.dl has a value not that is non-zero. So if we let this be a closed loop, let this be a closed loop, this is zero and this is your Kirchhoff's law. But this is not zero. Okay? So we need to be careful when doing quote-unquote Kirchhoff's law in our magnetic circuits. Okay? One loop is enough. Okay? One loop is enough. All right, so uh, we call this then, okay, let's just, let me just erase all those. We call this then, this integral of h dot dl. This is your magnetic potential. Okay, negative h dot dl. This is your magnetic potential, recall from the previous uh, lecture, lecture 7. And it is also called magnetomotive force or MMF. Similar to how we call the electric field electromotive force. Okay. Now, given uh, uh, some slab of material that is, uh, let's say it's a ferromagnetic material, that means it has a very high permeability. Okay. So, uh, it's shaped this way. Okay. And a... Um, and a, uh, the left leg of the material is, uh, has a, a coil of wires around it. Okay. This coil of wires creates an electric, a magnetic field that flows around this circuit right here. Given that, you can actually convert this circuit into some... Uh, you can convert this diagram or this drawing into some form of a DC circuit that you have already encountered. Okay, some form of DC circuit that you have already encountered. And with this, you can actually do some circuit analysis to solve for different parameters that is flowing through the given uh, geometry. Okay, so we call these resistors, we model them as resistors, not necessarily has having a resistance, they actually have what we call a reluctance. And this is the ability of a material to impede the flow of magnetic field. Okay? If for our electric field we have the resistance, which is the ability of the material to resist a flow or impede a flow of electrons, in magnetic circuits we have reluctance. Okay? And it's the ability of a material to resist a flow in magnetic flux. Okay? It has its own Ohm's law. And it's just basically the magnetic potential or the potential difference divided by the quote-unquote current or basically the magnetic flux. Okay? In terms of its magnetic field intensity, well, uh, it's just this. Vm, as we know, is negative integral of h dot dl. And phi here is basically integral of b dot ds, but we know that b is equal to mu h. Okay, so that's how this uh, h here appeared. Okay, it's worth noting that if we increase the magnetic field, at the, the numerator increases, but the denominator, denominator also increases. Therefore, the reluctance is purely geometry dependent, only dependent on dl and ds. Okay? So let's look at the analogies between your magnetic circuits and your electric circuits. The potential difference is defined by the field intensity. Okay? So both of these circuits have a field intensity within them flowing, within their quote-unquote conductors. Okay. There's a field intensity within them that drives the current okay. and defined by a scalar uh, multiple. Okay. The current is a scalar multiple of the, mag of the field intensity. The current density is a scalar multiple of the field intensity. Okay. The current is basically the surface integral of this uh, current density. 
the quote-unquote current in our magnetic circuits is a surface integral of the current density. Okay. If we have a constant, okay, a linearly isotropic homogeneous magnetic material, and we have a uniform uniform conductivity material, all right, and a uniform electric field here, uniform magnetic field here, the resistance is D over sigma S, the reluctance is D over mu S. Okay? So the analogy is that mu and S are actually, or mu and uh, sigma are actually uh, analogs of each other. Okay? So they define how much current will flow through a material. It's also the same here. They also have their own versions of Ohm's law. And they also have their own versions of Kirchhoff's law. However, for the Kirchhoff's law within the magnetic circuit, uh, it's actually equal to n times i. Right? Why is it like that? Because if you look at the magnetic circuit, if you look at the magnetic circuit, uh, visibly, if we don't, if we just ignore this first, so visibly, okay, visibly, uh, there is no, okay, there is no voltage source, quote unquote, voltage source connected to the magnetic circuit. Okay? There is no voltage source anywhere. It's just a block of uh, ferromagnetic material or so. It's just a block of material with some uh, permeability mu. Where is the voltage source? It comes from the fact that the magnetic field is not conservative. If it's <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> if the magnetic field is not conservative, then we can actually model that we can insert the magnetic field as a voltage source that is powering the uh, leg where it is. Okay? So this leg right here is actually this reluctance. And this coil is this voltage source. Okay? That's a big difference between your electric circuit and your magnetic circuit. Okay? But you'll see in the next chapter, okay, in the next lecture, that the electric field is not, is not actually conservative at all. The electric field is not conservative at all. Okay? So you'll see. Anyway. Alright, so uh, I'm saying all these concepts. I'm saying all these uh, new terms. Uh, let's see how it works. So uh, we have a toroid here. So the coil, the uh, coil around a toroid, but this toroid is just filled with air. Okay? So the toroid has 500 turns, some cross-sectional area of 6 cm squared, a mean radius of 15 cm. What's the mean radius? It's the radius at the middle of the cross-section. So it's from the center to this uh, area here, uh, this point here at the middle of the cross-sectional area. And the current in the coil is 4 amperes, given that it has an air core. Okay? So to solve for the magnetic field intensity, solve for the magnetic field intensity, first we need to uh, solve for other parameters. Okay. So the magnetic field intensity is dependent on, or uh, you can solve it from the value of the magnetic flux density, B. But to solve for B, you need to know the flux. And the flux can be solved by dividing the magnetic potential with the reluctance. Okay. But we don't know both. How will we know that? The, uh, the magnetic potential is equal to N multiplied to the current. This is basically the total, uh, what do you call this? It's just uh, the result of Ampere's law. Okay, how? This is actually... Recall that Vm is the integral of h dot dl. Okay? It's the integral of h dot dl. Alright? So, the integral of h dot dl is if we draw the toroid, okay, so uh, there are 
coils that is uh, basically wrapped around the toroid. Okay? Something like this. So the current goes out here, goes back in here, goes out here, goes uh, into here, etc., etc. If we uh, if we get the potential difference from this point and go around and back to this point, but not the same point, not touching it, we get some form of potential difference. So we're getting the voltage from here to here. Okay. Right? And how do you solve that? You can solve that by getting the current enclosed by this path right here. But it's not entirely closed. Alright? This path is not entirely closed, but it has some volt uh, current that it is surrounding it. I hope that made sense. Okay. So it's uh, it encloses a current which is equal to N times I. How? We know the number of turns, therefore we know the number of times the current flows out within the inner radius. Okay? And if we get the integral of this, that is equal to n times i. Okay? That's the magnetic potential. Okay? So getting the magnetic potential, that's just 4 amperes multiplied to 500 turns. So that's 2000 ampere turns. Getting the reluctance, is, uh, we get D over mu S. So D here is basically the length of the toroid, which is dependent on the mean radius. Okay. So divide that by this. Mu S is just mu naught. So mu is just mu naught because it's free space or air. And the cross-sectional area is 6 uh, square centimeters. So that's why it's 6, six times 10 to the minus 4. You get a reluctance of 1.25 times 10 to the 9 ampere turns per Weber. You can solve for the magnetic flux. Just do Ohm's law. You get this uh, value right here. You can solve for the magnetic uh, magnetic flux density. I divide it by S. All right. And you can now get the uh, magnetic field intensity within the toroidal coil. You get this expression, uh, this value right here. So it's B over mu. The mu is given. B, you have solved that. And you get this expression or this value for the magnetic field inside the toroid. You can check it using Ampere's circuital law. Ampere's law, okay, if we do Ampere's law, we, uh, we use the mean radius as the closed loop. Okay? We use the mean radius as the closed loop, then we have an enclosed current of n times i. That's the number of turns. So that's 500 turns going uh, around the toroid. Okay. And uh, that is equal to 2 pi times the radius, the mean radius. And you can solve for h phi. And it's the same as what we solved earlier. Okay. Some, uh, some pointers or some notes from this example. Okay. In this example, there are actually a lot of assumptions. One assumption is that we know that if we have a current going in, so we have a current going in, so the, the path of the, the magnetic field produced by this current loop is in this direction. The path of the magnetic, uh, of the magnetic field induced by this current is along this direction. Okay? The assumption is this two, so we have a magnetic field that's going in this direction. We have a magnetic field here that goes in this direction. These two cancel out. Why? Right? And that means, what does that imply? The magnetic field is solely inside our air gap or our core or within the loops of the uh, wires. Why? Right? But in reality, actually, there is some magnetic field that goes outside. Okay? There's some magnetic field that goes outside our toroidal coil. Okay? And these are actually losses. Okay? The magnetic field that emanates from the coil or from the core, sorry, 
the uh, magnetic field that emanates from the core are the losses, all right? And these are not accounted for when you're uh, solving the uh, magnetic circuit of this toroid. Okay. And that's also the assumption here in Ampere's law. That's why we, we are able to unify the answer between the magnetic circuit and Ampere's law is that we also assume that the magnetic field does not leak out of the toroid. Okay. And we have made similar assumptions before. One is the capacitor. We assume that the electric field is perfectly perpendicular, but in reality, there's an electric field that flows in this direction, in this streamline right here. We call this the fringing or the fringes. Okay? So I can I can I can type it's too small. Fringes. There you go. So this is called the fringing effect. And in our magnetic circuits and our uh, analysis of magnetic fields, sometimes we just assume that there are no fringes. And this is especially this is especially uh, important when you're going to solve what we call the inductance or the self-inductance of our uh, magnetic circuits, all right? So that's one big assumption. But um, with that assumption here in this setup, we get around one-fourth percent of an error. It's a reasonable assumption if you think about it. It's a very small error compared to the actual value, okay? So there are a lot of things that we do not account for in this circuit, but uh, just the error is just uh, small, if uh, I'd say so myself. Okay. So I think it's reasonable. Okay. So that is how you analyze magnetic circuits. Okay. So uh, don't worry, that's just one example in the slides. We'll have more. All right. So for now, let's move on to the next topic. If we have a potential energy in our electric field defined by this equation, okay, so this is where we have uh, static charges not moving. But for the magnetic field, okay, do note that for the magnetic field, that for the magnetic field, uh, there is actually current flowing. Charges are moving, even though they have a constant motion. Charges are moving. Okay? And uh, we can't directly derive, actually, a, an expression. All right? But if we assume some conditions are true, we'll arrive at a similar expression for the energy stored in a magnetic field. Okay? So uh, it's just an, an uh, analogous between your electric field and magnetic field. You just get the volumetric integral of the flux density dotted to the field intensity. Okay? Flux density dotted to the field intensity. Flux density dotted to the field intensity. Okay? So that's how you solve the potential energy on magnetic fields. So this is the energy stored due to a magnetic field. And we know that uh, some circuit devices are circuit circuit elements actually store energy in the magnetic field. And these are your inductors. Okay? So uh, the inductance, the formal definition of inductance, as you know, uh, what you know, the inductance resists a change in current. Sorry, resists a change in voltage, LDI over DT. Okay? So the voltage across the inductor is equal to this equation. That's what you know. But the formal definition of inductance is just basically if we have if we have capacitance which links charge and the voltage, we have the resistance which links the voltage and the current. Now we have the inductance which links or which unifies the flux linkage to the current. The inductance then is defined as the ratio or uh, the ratio between the flux linkage and the current. And the flux linkage is equal to the number of turns within uh, of, of uh, our inductor loop multiplied to the magnetic flux that is linking them together. So the assumption here is that the flux between 
the loops are equal okay, or constant. So that's the flux linkage. And to solve for the inductance, it's equal to lambda, the flux linkage, divided by I. Okay? So uh, just some note that the inductance is the capability of a material or the measure of the uh, device's capability to store magnetic energy. And the energy stored is 1 half Li squared. If there is current in an inductor, there is a magnetic field and there is energy stored. So recall for your uh, capacitor, okay? for the capacitor, the electric field energy is 1 half CV squared. Okay. All right. So this is the formal definition of inductance. So let's look at the diagram right here. So this is uh, the structure of an inductor. Okay. So uh, let me just. There you go. So the current is flowing here. It, uh, look at the direction of the pointer. All right. And each uh, part of the loop has their own. Uh, has their own magnetic field induced because of the current. Okay. If we pa uh, pack them tightly together, if we, they are very close together, then the magnetic field that is going out of the coil is negligible. Okay. That means that the uh, total magnetic flux is just N multiplied to the uh, magnetic flux inside the coils. All right. So uh, there's that's one big uh, assumption right there is that there is no magnetic field that is leaking out of the toroid. All right. So if we uh, go by this definition of the inductance, we know that phi here is dependent on B. And I here is also dependent on B. Okay? By Ampere's law, I, or the current enclosed, is the integral of H dot DL. Since B is equal to mu H, okay, B is equal to mu H, then we can uh, substitute H for B. This becomes B over mu. right? So in terms of B, the inductance is equal to this expression right here. Okay. So, uh, this is actually similar to your capacitor. The capacitor is dependent on the electric flux density. The inductor is dependent also on the flux density right here. Okay. So they are solved in the same way, but uh, look at the integral signs. Okay. The magnetic flux is not a closed surface, but the electric flux, we need a closed surface. The magnetic flux uh, density, the loop, uh, the line integral is looped, but the line integral for the capacitor is not looped. Okay. So that's one major difference between them. Okay, so as you can see, our inductor, our resistor, the capacitor, and the reluctance all have, actually all have the same form of uh, solving them. Two integrals, all right, the ratio of two integrals for our reluctance and our resistance, it's dl over ds, and it's dependent on the magnetic or, or the field intensities. For our inductance and our capacitance, it's the flux densities and it's ds divided by dl. All right? And all of them are scaled by some constant right here. So they are just analogous terms. So you have already encountered this before, but in the form of electric field. So there are a lot of analogies between your electric field and magnetic field. Some major differences, but you can think of them as basically siblings. Okay? And you can compare similarities. There are still some differences. But if, you're, uh, if you have already mastered the electric field, then you can easily, easily adjust to solving or analyzing magnetic fields. All right. So an example. 
let's consider the inductance of the same coil that we found uh, that we solved earlier. So to solve for the inductance, we need to know the current enclosed, okay? So that is I and the flux linkage. Okay? First we need the magnetic field, okay, to get the magnetic flux and then solve for the total uh, flux linkage and then use the current that we have. Okay? So, to solve for the magnetic field inside, we can use Ampere's law. Alright? We can use Ampere's law. So, uh, we already did that earlier. And we got this expression for the magnetic field intensity. For the magnetic flux density, just multiply mu. Since this is an air core, mu is equal to mu sub zero, approximately. Okay? Since air is approximately a vacuum, then we have the magnetic flux density is equal to mu naught times this expression that we got earlier, and we got this. Okay? Then, solve for the magnetic flux. Just multiply the, uh, the magnetic flux density to the cross-sectional area S, and you get this expression. And finally, you can get the flux linkage by multiplying n the number of turns in the coil, so n phi, and we get this expression for the flux linkage. And finally, solve for the inductance, that's n phi divided by i. And you can see that the inductance is dependent on the geometry of your system. So this is the uh, mean length of the toroidal coil. S is the cross-sectional area. Uh, N is the number of turns, and mu naught is some constant. Okay. This, it's not dependent on how much magnetic field are we applying inside the system. Okay. Similar to a capacitor. All right, so another example. So uh, you've already seen this. It's your, <laughs> it's your coaxial cable. All right. So for long coaxial cable, we know that the magnetic field, if you have a current flowing here, so this is the center conductor, this is the outer conductor. If you have a magnetic, uh, sorry, a current is flowing in this direction, the magnetic field circles around that current. And it's equal to this expression right here. This leads to your magnetic flux equal to I mu over 2 pi rho. Okay. So... The uh, differential flux is equal to BDS, okay? And we know that uh, the, sorry, the uh, magnetic flux is only in the AV direction. Magnetic flux density is in the AV direction. Therefore, we're going to use a surface that is pointing in that direction also. The differential area of that surface pointing in A phi hat is equal to D rho dz. Since the magnetic flux is constant across z, then if you integrate this dz, it just becomes z. That's why it, that's why it became z here. Sorry, here. Okay. So we just integrate this with respect to rho to get for the total flux that is passing through this region right here. And you integrate that from the inner radius to the outer radius, you get the total flux, which is equal to this expression right here. Okay. Now, to get the inductance, you just need to get uh, you multiply this by the number of turns of the coaxial cable. But in this case, since the current does not loop anywhere, it's just flowing on a straight line, then the uh, n here is equal to 1. And that leads to this expression divided by i. And we're left with this value right here. So if we want to solve for the inductance per unit length, we just need to divide L by z. Since the unit length is dependent on z. Okay? And we get this expression for the inductance of the coaxial cable. Okay? One thing that is unique about inductance is that if we have two coils that are close to each other but do not have the same current flowing through them, these two coils actually interact with each other through their magnetic fields. And we call the interaction between them or we model the interaction between them as what we call mutual inductance. 
Okay? So consider this system that we have two coils that are not connected. Okay? If they are not connected, uh, they could possibly have different currents. Okay? If we let coil 1 have a current I1, coil 1 has a current I1, it produces a magnetic field okay, in this direction, and the magnetic field enters coil 2. This magnetic field enters coil 2. And then, basically, there's flux passing through this area covered by coil 2. Okay? The total flux that is passing through coil 2 is due to coil 1. Okay? Therefore, if there's magnetic flux passing through this, there's also flux linkage. Okay? That's the number of turns within coil 2 times the magnetic flux passing through it. Okay? And finally, the, the very definition of mutual inductance is the same as your self-inductance is that it's flux linkage divided by the current. But in this case, it's the flux linkage on coil 2 divided by the current in coil 1. Okay? So there's a magnetic field produced by coil 1 entering coil 2. Okay? Produced by coil 1 entering coil 2. Okay? And then... Because of this flux here, create a flux linkage here in this coil, second coil. And uh, to model the, uh, the interaction between them, we can use what we call mutual inductance. Okay. And that's the end of this lecture. So again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to comment in the comment section below. Your, <coughs> excuse me, your classmates could have the same question. They're just, they could just be uh, shy from asking. Okay? So uh, try to uh, ask any of your questions. All right? And I'll try to answer them as soon as I can and as clearly as I can. All right? See you next meeting.